welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices. Thank you for your letters and your questions. We appreciate receiving them and answering them when we have a chance. Our speaker today is Dr. Barnett Colvin, who is the training director at the University of Maryland for the study of terrorism. It's a US Department of Homeland Security Center for Excellence. He is also the CEO of BSK Consulting and a lecturer in political science and international affairs at the George Washington University. That's just some of his positions. The rest you can check on his extensive bio. As far as we are concerned, Dr. Coben was our youngest intern in our United Nations internship program. He was 14 years old when he started and he was with us till he was about 17. So Burnett, it's a pleasure seeing you and over to you. Excellent. Dr. Durbeck, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be back and doing something with WIT again. Um, and to all <laughs> who dialed in, thank you for devoting the time and attention. And so at, doctors, at Dr. Durbeck's request, I'll speak for about 30 to 35 minutes, and then I look forward to opening this up to a lively discussion and Q&A. Um, and I'm happy to ask, answer substantive questions, but also sort of questions on career trajectory or anything else, if I can be of assistance. So nothing's off limits. Um, with that said, what I wanted to do today was first give you a little bit of a brief background about myself and my own experiences, starting with my involvement at, with World Information Transfer. And as I was sort of prepping for this talk, I realized how long ago that was and it was making me feel old. But nonetheless, I will give you that background. And then I'll give you an overview of sort of three current research projects related to terrorism and counterterrorism and sort of three projects related more to this current era of great power competition, um, just to give you a sense of what I do on a daily basis. But as Dr. Durbeck said, I uh, was involved with WIT as an intern um, starting at the age of 14, and I stayed on for a number of years um, in a variety of capacities, including serving as WIT's treasurer um, for a bit. I ultimately um, left WIT sadly, um, in order to go back to school and pursue a PhD in political science. Um, and again, it was important, it was sad to leave WIT because it was an organization that, it's a great organization and it was an organization that I invested a lot of time and energy um, and emotions into, but that sort of move into going back to graduate school got me where I am today. Um, to that end, I've been at the University of Maryland for the last five years since finishing my PhD and I work at a sort of non-traditional department at UMD. So it's the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism, as Dr. Durbeck indicated, better known by its acronym START. And so we're non-traditional in the sense that we're multidisciplinary, right? I am definitely in the, minor, in the majority as a political scientist, but we have a variety of social sciences, anthropology, sociology, um, criminal justice, criminology, We've got geography and we've got some sort of applied math, even though that's clearly not social science um, faculty at the center. And we tend to do sort of rigorous long-term strategic work in support of the US government. So it's all academic research, but it's often funded by US government grants, um, albeit not exclusively. And so at, at start, I'm our training director, so I'm responsible for a practitioner education. We do a lot of teaching in terms of short courses for US military, um, law enforcement, the intelligence community, as well as overseas partners. But I also re lead our counterterrorism research team and our near peer competition research teams. And I'll be telling you a little bit more about those as I get into it. Um, on the side, I'm also in a, a a um, sort of non-resident faculty member at Joint Special Operations University, the US Air Force Special Operations School. And this year I'm doing a fellowship at the US Military Academy at West Point. So a fair bit of teaching for sort of the DOD environment as well. So that's me in a nutshell. I wanted to talk to you first about sort of the counterterrorism research portfolio. 
And before I get into the substance of this discussion, I think it's helpful to start with sort of some definitions of key terms. And really, I just want to define terrorism. This is a term that I know you have all heard used extensively by your elected leaders, by the media, um, perhaps at a family discussion, or perhaps um, in the chambers of the United Nations, if you've gone to relevant meetings um, in your capacity as a WIT intern. But it's a term that's often used imprecisely. One, because the average journalist may, or politician or UN representative may not know sort of the nuanced definition, but two, it's also selectively used because it's a term that carries a lot of political baggage, right? To call someone a terrorist is uh, normatively bad and it has that negative baggage attached. And I saw this a lot when I was living overseas. So I spent two years living in Peru and Colombia doing field work as a um, PhD student. And I kept interacting with Peruvian military officers who had been trained, who understood US doctrine, had been trained in the United States, and they knew definitionally what was terrorism and what wasn't. And yet they kept calling things that clearly weren't terrorism. And I finally called one of the officers that I became friendly with on this. And I said, hey, you're being really imprecise with this term, what gives? And he's like, yeah, I know, but you're American. And I know you talk to your colleagues at the US Embassy. And if they think Peru is a terrorism problem, there's gonna be more foreign assistance from the US government for um, going to, to Peru. Whereas if we just have a narcotics problem or an insurgency problem, it's less of a priority for the US government. Right, so there's all kinds of perverse incentives um, to be loose with the terminology. And so before I talk about sort of my own work in this space, I want to define some key, a key term. And so academics, as well as the US government, as well as the UN, et cetera, seem to agree on a couple of key tenets on this, of this definition. And of course, the UN doesn't actually have a formal definition of terrorism, but you can find um, aspects of this in various Security Council resolutions. And so I think the key sort of tenets of terrorism is that it operates by instilling fear. And what I mean by this is that terrorism is a weapon of the weak used against the strong, right? A group like Al Qaeda or the Islamic State don't necessarily gravitate naturally towards terrorism. Rather, they come to it out of a realization that they cannot hope to win in a sort of set piece military engagement with the US army or even a small military force in a developing country. Um, but they can hope to perhaps achieve their objectives by terrorizing the civilian population. So the goal of a terrorist organization is not to win sort of a battlefield military victory by defeating the opposing force, but rather to scare the larger population such that they pressure their government, their elected representatives, et cetera, to change um, the behavior of the country, to change the country's foreign policy in a way that's favorable to the terrorist group. And to give you sort of a concrete example, and I do not mean this to be um, disrespectful of the victims of 9-11, I'm a New Yorker at heart, um, but I would argue that for Al-Qaeda, the target on 9-11-2001 was not the 3,000 Americans who died on, on that day, but rather the more than 300 million other Americans who were not directly impacted, right? They weren't injured or killed, but they were definitely scared. I remember watching that coverage on 9-11. I remember being home from school. We got let out a half day and every single television channel um, kept showing the planes hitting the towers over and over and over again, right? It had a psychological effect. And so that's how terrorism operates. And most definitions, both academic and sort of legal put forward by governments, international organizations like the UN tend to agree on sort of that um, focus. In order to sort of scare the population, a second tenet here is that there is violence or at least the threat of violence that is unlawful in nature. So we're not talking about sort of licit violent behavior like, um, that, like that that might occur in law enforcement encounters or uh, in declared shooting wars or things of that sort. But we're talking about sort of lic illicit violence that violates norms. Um, and importantly, it doesn't actually have to succeed, right? The threat of the violence, if it's credible, can be sufficient to terrorize the population and can count as terrorism. 
The third sort of aspect of various definitions that are agreed upon amongst various different stakeholders is that there is some type of goal, be it political, social, economic, religious, et cetera, but there's a goal that the actor or actors are trying to achieve here. And so I remember sort of watching the news coverage of the Austin, Texas mail bombings that certainly scared people. And the Austin police chief was getting a lot of flack from the media for not calling this terrorism. And the media was arguing that this was biased because in this case, they knew who the perpetrator was and they knew him to be a white American male. And so the media was saying, if this guy was Muslim and an immigrant, the police would have called it terrorism immediately, whereas they're waiting because of this guy's race and national origin. And that may or may not be true. I have honestly no idea what the Austin, Texas police um, commissioner's motivations were for not calling this terrorism. It may have been biased, but it may have also been based on this definition. It turns out, while those acts were horrible, this guy left no manifesto. He did not appear to belong to any type of group, harbor any type of ideology, or anything of the sort. This guy may very well have just been a deranged lunatic who was intent on doing as much violence for the sake of violence without any specific aims. And if that were true, then definitionally, while that, those bombings were certainly really bad, it wouldn't meet the criteria for terrorism. Um, so those are sort of the three tenets that are reasonably universally agreed upon by governments, by international organizations, and by academics. There's sort of two other components to the definition that are debated, and I'll throw them out there, um, but again, these are debated. One, can non-civilians be targets, i.e. can the military be a target of a terrorist attack? And I would argue yes under certain circumstances, but again, open for discussion. And so, for example, targeting the military at home, outside of the confines of an ongoing war or something of that sort, um, say, shooting up a restaurant near a military base where off-duty soldiers like to go eat, I would say that could count. Shooting at troops, uniformed troops, during a set-piece battle in a declared conflict, I would argue that that's not terrorism. The second sort of debatable content, component of money definitions is can states perpetrate terrorism? Um, so a lot of definitions and especially legal definitions say terrorism is exclusively the domain of non-state actors like your Al-Qaeda's, like your Islamic states of the world and not states themselves. Now, even those definitions leave room, leave room for state sponsorship of terrorism like you see with the um, Iranian I'm sorry, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran, or with the Inter-Services Intelligence in Pakistan, who both of whom are state entities that do sponsor designated foreign terrorist organizations. But can a state itself commit terrorism? And that's a legal gray area. It's a definitional gray area. The Trump administration, by the way, seemed to sort of push the needle a little bit further and say, yes, they can, in designating the IRGC, the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization. We can discuss that in the Q&A if anyone's interested, but that's a three hour discussion potentially in and of itself, so I'll move on. So that's more or less in a nutshell what I'm talking about when I um, use the word terrorism. And so in terms of the work that I've been doing over the last five years or so at STARB, I've been sort of building upon the work of other research portfolios, other academics at START and elsewhere across the country. The academic community and also sort of the government policy community already have a really rich understanding of terrorism, right? There's a lot of knowledge about the various groups that are out there, their leadership structures, their ideologies, the attacks that they perpetrated. And indeed, for any of you who are students of this, START maintains the Global Terrorism Database, and this is freely available online. It's a data set of over 200,000 terrorist attacks, and it includes worldwide coverage from 1970 to 2020. And it's, of course, being updated annually, but there's no 2021 data out yet. Um, so we know a lot about the threat. What we don't know a ton about is about, or at least nearly enough about, is the work of government in response to this threat, right? That knowledge clearly exists by the different independent government entities that are doing the work, but it hasn't been cataloged in a systematic way within the US government, right? The State Department 
doesn't necessarily have full situational awareness of what the Department of Defense is doing. And certainly it hasn't been cataloged um, between governments. To what extent do the Canadians have good knowledge of what the French are doing in Mauritania, for example? Um, I don't know the answer to the question, but I would guess there's a huge knowledge gap there. And then finally, terrorism is not so much a contest between a state and a terrorist, but rather it's a contest for control over the hearts and minds of the civilian population that's caught in the middle. Terrorist groups cannot survive absent support, support from the local population, right? They need the local population to provide foodstuffs, to provide funding, to provide fighters, and also to provide intelligence on sort of government troop movements and other activities undertaken against terrorist organizations by the state. So this is very much a competition for the hearts and minds of the population that's caught in the middle. And the least amount of sort of academic work has been devoted to understanding the perceptions of these local populations. So in running our counterterrorism research, I focused on sort of trying to collect data that speaks to all three of these aspects and better integrate it. And so a couple of different projects that stem, stem out of that um, that I wanna to talk to you about. And so the first is a training program that I've been running for the past two years in Benin. And for those of you who aren't great with your West African geography, it's a tiny little country in coastal West Africa. It's bordered by Nigeria. Nigeria is its biggest neighbor um, and Nigeria is to the east. But above Benin is uh, Burkina Faso. And so the problem that I, the Beninois were having was that they had created this really small long range reconnaissance unit of their border police to go defend their borders against terrorist incursion. And so basically there were two different threat vectors. The first was coming down from Mali into Burkina Faso and spilling over into Benin. And these were local West African groups that were affiliated with both Al Qaeda or the Islamic State. And then the second bit was Boko Haram in Nigeria. And there wasn't so much a spillover of violence on the Nigerian front into Benin, but cr illegal cross-border trafficking between the two countries to, and mostly illicit goods. So we're not talking drugs, we're not talking weapons, we're talking household goods. Um, but because the tax rates in Nigeria and Benin were so different, you could make a ton of money by buying home goods in Benin, smuggling them across the border and selling them without paying the taxes. And inversely, you could make a ton of money on the Benin side by smuggling cheap Nigerian oil and gas into Benin. And those funding routes were actually financing a lot of Boko Haram's activities. And so the problem that this force had was that there were 270 officers, 75 officers. And so even though Benin's a small country, if this was the most efficient border security force in the world, and I assure you it wasn't, it was woefully inadequate in size. And so what we did is we developed a training curriculum on sort of community-oriented approaches to policing, to enable the, this unit to make inroads with the local population so that the population would be supportive of them and provide them with information, right? If this unit could get tip-offs from the local population, they might, they just might have a chance of actually showing up in the right place at the right time. And so in particular, we sort of targeted local nomadic herders. Because to survive as a nomadic herder, you have to have really good situational awareness as to what's going on from a security perspective, where you are now with your herd, but also where you've just been and where you're going in two weeks time. And if we could build rapport, encourage sort of respect for human rights um, and encourage a strong working relationship, that would work in sort of changing the ideologies and changing the um, views of the local population and also encourage them to provide tips. And so we fielded a, what I think was a rather novel sort of survey experiment in order to gauge how effective these trainings were at encouraging sort of collaboration between these two um, groups. And I'll talk you through that survey in just a minute, but let me give you sort of an overview of the training. It was a week long sort of classroom based training on sort of the core tenets of terrorism and counterterrorism, of policing in a democratic society, um, and those were the first four, and respect for human rights. And those were the first four days for the officers. We paid local community members from the affiliated, the afflicted villages to come in and get a one day sort of a bridge training. So if they had a 
um, similar understanding to the police. But then on the fifth day, we brought everyone together for a number of sort of simulations. These were tabletop role play exercises wherein the local villagers got to play the role of the police and vice versa. And if these groups, various groups collaborated, the simulation worked such that the outcome was a success against a local Al Qaeda or a local Islamic State affiliate. If they didn't efficiently collaborate, the terrorist won. And so the simulation did a couple of things. One, it let each side walk a mile in the other side's shoes, right? Because the villagers were playing the role of police and vice versa. Two, it forced the police and villagers to build relationships, both through the game that they were playing, but also through the coffees and the, and the lunch breaks and so on and so forth. So folks who never would have talked to each other in real life were suddenly talking, whether it was about terrorism or football, it didn't matter, you built some rapport. And three, you only won at the game if you cooperated. So it hopefully instilled sort of a cooperative mindset in the participants. In order to evaluate the efficacy we did a number of interviews um, with elites in these villages, as well as just average villagers to sort of gain a sense of their um, relative support for the police, for various terrorist organizations, et cetera. But we also fielded a survey experiment, whereas wherein we asked folks about their support for the police and their support for terrorist organizations, both before and after the trainings occurred. And now, of course, and the reason this was an experiment is because, of course, if I say, hey, I'm an American academic with funding from the U.S. government, do you support al-Qaeda? Of course, the answer is going to be no, irrespective of what the truth is. There's really strong incentives to falsify your preference there. So instead, we use some experimental techniques. So, for example, we use what's called an endorsement experiment. And so we broke up the sample into a treatment group and a control group. The treatment group got a question, or sorry, let me start with the control group. The control group got a question that said, various organizations have advocated for a microinsurance scheme for small farmers. It functions like this. And there was about a half paragraph description of what the insurance scheme would function. So a benign project that has nothing to do with terrorism. The treatment group got almost exactly the same question, except instead of saying just various groups, it said various groups, including Al Qaeda, have advocated a small microinsurance scheme. And so if I'm being asked that question as a local villager, and I say, yes, I su uh, support this microinsurance scheme, there's no way for the survey enumerator to know if this person supports it because they think the insurance program is a great idea, or if they have no opinion of the insurance program, but because they like Al Qaeda, they support the program. So at an individual level, I can't tell whether or not you're supportive of Al Qaeda or not from your answer, but, at an aggregate level, by comparing the average response across the treatment and control group, I'm able to tease out what percentage of the population were influenced towards supporting the program based on the fact that it had also been endorsed by Al Qaeda. And so I'm able to back that out. And we actually saw about a 45% decrease in um, support for various different, and we did this for multiple terrorist organizations. We saw about a 45% decrease on average in support for the terrorist organizations and about a 30% increase for the police and other sort of local government um, entities as a result of this training. Um, so this is an example of sort of an applied project that we've done that takes this sort of nuanced understanding of terrorism and terrorist groups, of what the government's doing and of the importance of the population into consideration. This is all undergirded by more sort of purely academic research that I've also been doing. And I'll be much quicker in discussing those um, since I think the applied work is probably more interesting to many of the folks on this call. But I've also written a book and it is stuck in um, security review. So I learned a really good lesson about interviewing members of the US intelligence community. Um, so I finished the book in June and it is still undergoing review. So I have no idea when it'll be out much to my publisher's chagrin but the book is on counterterrorism effectiveness and looked at sort of the, I think the core argument of the book is that the approach that the US government and many other Western governments have taken to countering terrorism over the last two decades since 9-11 has not been well thought out, right? At a tactical level, 
there's no one better than US Special Operations Forces at killing or capturing high value terrorist targets. The problem is that's not, that's attacking sort of the terrorist group's capacity, but not the actual motivations that lead these groups to join the fight. And unless you also target the motivation, it's really, really easy, as we've seen over the last 20 years, to rebuild that capacity or that capability by recruiting new members. And indeed, at the extreme, capturing or killing local terrorists might actually encourage their family members, their relatives, their community members to join the fight, because they don't necessarily see these guys as terrorists. They see them in other um, ways, perhaps. Um, and so that's the core argument of the book. But it also looked at sort of the lack of interagency collaboration within the US government and some challenges in terms of intergovernmental -govern collaboration between the US government and many of the US partners. And so that book was a ton of fun to write. It let me sort of synthesize all the sort of core problems with terrorism and counterterrorism that I've been playing with and that have been running around in my head over the last five years into a manuscript. And I'm really excited for it to come out whenever it gets through security review. And so the other project that I'm working on is a data integration project. And so it turns out, as I said at the beginning, we know a lot about terrorist groups and their activities. We don't know nearly as much about what government's doing, and we know even less about the population stuck in the middle. But the data's out there. It's just, in, it's just messy and in a bunch of different locations. So we spent about a year, um, and I had a bunch of grad students and others helping with this because it was a pretty involved research effort, but we spent about a year cataloging over uh, uh, well over 2000 variables that potentially spoke to some aspect of terrorism and counterterrorism. And some of these were obvious, like terrorist attacks from the global terrorism database, but others much less so, using, pop, uh, using sort of popular opinion polling, like the Afrobarometer for Africa, Latino barometer for Latin America, Middle East, or I'm sorry, it was Arab barometer for the Middle East and North Africa, uh, to get a sense of sort of popular sentiments towards their government versus towards other actors, including sort of non-state armed groups and things of that sort. And then organizing all this data into a sort of common framework. And so we used some existing NSF National Science Foundation funded software tools and brought all this data together. So you can now download this application. It's in a very, very messy sort of beta form um, and have access to all this data in one place. And I'm waiting on funding to sort of take this to the next level and fill in some gaps for sort of key data points that we think are important that we couldn't find based on sort of theoretical literature and also improve the graphic user interface for the software tool so it's actually user friendly because if it's not user friendly, it won't get used. So those are sort of three aspects of the counterterrorism research and work I'm doing. Very quickly, since I know we're getting close to about the 30 minute mark, I did want to talk about sort of great power competition in brief before I open this up to questions. Because so this is the other aspect of the work I'm doing. And so if anyone's read the 2018 National Defense Strategy of the United States, um, you'll already know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, this is a really short document. It's freely available on the internet. If you just Google 2018 NDS, you will find a PDF of it. I think it's about, I think it's about 12 pages. So it's a quick, quick read. Um, but it very clearly articulates that after 20 years, terrorism and counterterrorism are now national security priority number two for the US government after competition with near peer competitors, which the NDS describes as sort of Russia and China for, first and foremost, and secondarily Iran and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea or colloquially North Korea um, second most. And what, and for me, this actually does relate pretty heavily to a lot of the work we've been doing on terrorism and counterterrorism, because it turns out that many of these powers don't want to shoot, fight a declared shooting war with the United States. They realize quite correctly that they can achieve their strategic objectives much more cheaply by using sort of violent proxy forces. Indeed, Ukraine, uh, sorry, Russia demonstrated this very clearly in Ukraine, um, both in, a, in Crimea, but especially in the Donbass, right, wherein they were able to embrace ambiguity and say, no, 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 these are not Russian soldiers, even though they clearly were, 
Um, and in fact, these are local militias who were supporting perhaps, but they're not Russians, um, and use that ambiguity to achieve their desired end state in Ukraine without inviting as nearly as much backlash as would have otherwise been the case if Russia just declared war on Ukraine and invaded from, say, their Western European neighbors like Germany and France, et cetera. And so I've been playing a little bit in that space. I spent a year doing research that US Special Operations Command um, funded, uh, looking at sort of whether or not there were predictable indications and warnings of these types of events unfolding. And we used Ukraine as one of the case studies. And we were able to sort of identify with about 80% accuracy, certain types of messaging tropes, certain types of kinetic actions that signaled a much larger um, event was likely about to start taking place um, out of that project. And then a second project that I'm working on right now that I'm really excited about is on sort of cyber and influence operations. So there's been lots of discussion in the media about say Russian meddling in US elections or Russian meddling in Colombian elections. Uh, okay, probably no one other than me because I lived in Colombia is following the latter point, but it makes a lot of press in Colombia. Um, but there's all, there's really good documented evidence of sort of Russian and Chinese use of the internet for divisive ends targeting US populations, whether that's through sort of influence in terms of exacerbating social tensions, racial tensions, et cetera, that are very evident in the United States already, or through sort of more pronounced cyber kinetic attacks. So you can think of sort of multiple Russian attacks on the Ukrainian power grid, which did neutralize huge segments of the grid for multiple days at a time. And I'm not a cyber expert, I'm a political scientist. But what I've realized in talking to sort of government personnel is that there's a general lack of understanding about how these ways of waging war, and I do think this is warfare, um, manifest themselves. And so what I've done is with my former PhD student, who's an active duty US Army officer who has a cyber background, her and I are co-editing a series um, that will be live beginning next month on West Point's Modern War, war Institute's website. And it's gonna be about 15 pieces by leading experts from across the US government, as well as some foreign partners, across industry and academia on sort of the key themes that you need to know for understanding cyber and influ influence campaigns as it relates to great power competition. All of these pieces are capped at 200, sorry, 2,500 words. So they're all sort of a 15 minute read that you can get on Monday morning with your cup of coffee. And indeed we're gonna watch one a week starting the week of March 15th um, with the idea of this providing sort of a general Reader's Digest version of what's going on and what you need to know. And so that's more or less of an overview of some of my favorite projects from the last five years or so. With that said, I do wanna really make sure we have ample time for discussion and Dr. Durbeck told me 30 to 35 minutes. So I've been going for 33. So why don't we start with questions? And before I open up the floor, I received two questions via Dr. Durbach from one of you in advance. And so, the, so I'll go ahead and answer those to get things started. And why I'm answering those, perhaps the rest of you can start thinking about any other questions or things you wanna discuss. And so the first question I'll read it to you was, what documents regulate slash provide security of journalists in the territories affected by military action or beyond the control of the official government? Who provides their safety? And so I do wanna clarify that I'm an academic and not a journalist. And there are different sort of codes of ethics and different sort of um, protocols that govern academic research versus sort of journalistic work um, in conflict zones. But the short answer to your question is there isn't much. I mean, certainly there's sort of legal and normative reasons why journalists should be pr protected. But in all honesty, is your average terrorist group going to respect that? Maybe, maybe not. And so I'll give you an example. I was doing some work in Brazil and I was in Rio and I went into a favela. So these are massive shanty towns that are basically self-governed um, by the local um, head of the organized crim criminal syndicate that's operating there. It's usually drugs, but all kinds of other rackets. And in that case, I went in by myself and I was extremely safe because I had permission 
from the local folks who were leading this favela to be there. And so it was made very, very clear to everyone in the community that I'm doing academic research and I'm allowed to be there according to the criminal who organizes this. And if anyone touches Barnett, they're gonna have to deal with the criminal who organizes the favela. I was probably safer in that favela than I was in sort of the touristy areas of downtown Rio by the beach. Um, and so that can certainly be done by journalists. Some terrorist organizations are gonna be receptive to the press um, and will invite journalists in. Um, and that coordination can happen. On the other hand, though, there's no US government entity or international organization that's guaranteeing the security of journalists. And so better funded organizations like say the BBC or MSNBC or CNN often hire security contractors to support their journalists in these types of environments. And these individuals are typically special operate, retired special operations soldiers um, or people of that sort who will accompany the journalist. And you'll never see them on camera in a news broadcast, but many media organizations do hire um, security in these types of environments. And a lot of them take out sort of kidnap and ransom insurance on their journalists. And of course, they don't tell you this, um, they don't advertise it, but it's largely up to the media entity to ensure the security of journalists. And that's great if you're working for a well-funded organization like BBC, it's not so great if you're trying to work in a conflict zone as an independent journalist or from some small sort of press agency. And I wish I had sort of a more compelling answer for you that there's some international body that guarantees your safety, but there is not to my knowledge. The second question, and it's clearly from the same person, I'm getting the sense that this person is a journalist or is interested in becoming a journalist, perhaps studying that right now, but should a journalist follow a standard or observe a rule such as a balance of the views when covering events related to terrorism. And I think objectivity is really important in journalism writ large beyond just the discussion of terrorism. And indeed the criticism we've seen in the US over the last four years about sort of journalism and the entire enterprise stems from sort of a perceived lack of objectivity. Um, and indeed in the US we have sort of talking head talk shows that I would argue really aren't journalism or news but that often get passed off as such. Um, so yes, in short, I think objectivity is really important. When we're talking about terrorism or counterterrorism, I think it's extremely important that journalists who are covering these events invest the time to understand sort of what the prevailing sort of definitions are of these terms, like I took the time to go over with you at the front end, rather than calling everything terrorism. The reality is, if I label an event that's not terrorism, terrorism as a journalist, that's probably good for ratings. More people are gonna turn into that, uh, to my um, broadcast at 8 p.m. or buy my newspaper, et cetera. But I think there needs to be sort of a, or there needs to be a push to resist the, sort of those ratings driven temptations and be accurate about what we label as terrorism or not terrorism. I think there's also sort of a broader argument about how much coverage should these events get? Because at the end of the day, some of these actors are looking for publicity, right? The terrorist groups themselves can use the publicity to show that they're effective and start recruiting. Because if I'm the Islamic State, I wanna show that I'm more capable than Al Qaeda so that the next, so that people who are looking to join, join my organization as opposed to theirs. And so the more journalists amplify these attacks, the more that plays into the terrorist group's hand, it may also play into the perpetrator's hand, right? Some of the individual perpetrators are looking for fame and notoriety. They want their um, name on the front page of the New York Times. And so how do you, and I don't know where the right, back, right line is because you need to balance sort of those considerations with the fact that the public does have a right and a need to know about what's going on. So the Algerians, for example, have passed laws uh, sort of banning the discussion. So if there's a terrorist attack in Algeria, a spokesperson from the Ministry of Defense gets on television, says an attack occurred here at this time. And they never provide you the name of the group nor the perpetrators because they don't want to give these people sort of uh, promotional material. And that's all the coverage you'll ever get out of sort of official sources in Algeria. That's prob it's been really effective in Algeria, but from sort of a public need to know, it's probably overly restrictive. But there's got to be some happy medium between how can I get as much coverage out of this event so I can sell papers versus sort of the public versus right to know, 
versus the desire not to play into the hands of a terrorist group or the individual attackers. The, thank you, Barnett. Yes. That was wonderful. I just wanted to say that I think that your definition of counterterrorism and the importance of acknowledging and realizing that the goal of the terrorists is to provide and in, increase the fear of already a public that is not exactly feeling comfortable. And whatever is going on, uh, even with the COVID, it exacerbates the internal natural fear flight or fight response. And most people uh, resolve to fly. They are afraid of the response rather. And they the only way that they can do uh, handle it is to go and seek um, the politicians that will take on their cause. And the other thing that I wanted to point out that with the identification of either the victor or uh, the aggressor. So if you identify with the victim, you shy away from everything because you just enclose yourself. When you identify with the aggressor, that's where you join organizations that in your opinion and your perception create a situation that will make you feel powerful. Mm -hmm. So that's a very, very early basic the human nature is you know the uh, libido and aggression. You either love or you hate. And we are made of that. And unless we learn to use our brain to control it, it is not going to change very much. But this is a question actually relating to that uh, um, from another student. Is it possible in the future to reduce the impact of terrorist organization on our lives? So yes, don't let it get to you, um, right? It says <laughs> the media, but for those of you who are living in the United States, you are more likely to win the mega millions jackpot than you are to be killed in a terrorist attack. And to be clear, I am not recommending you go out and buy lottery tickets because the odds of winning are infinitesimally small, right? You're also far more likely to die of heart disease, especially in this country, um, than to die in a terrorist attack, right? So we shouldn't let this fear get to us and change how we live our lives at least in sort of a Western context. If you're living in Syria, then my advice would be quite a bit different, um, but I'm assuming most of you are not. And I think the reason we let this get to us is because the way in which people die in terrorist attacks when they do is sensationalized. It's extremely bloody, they're mass casualty events, um, and we feel totally powerless. Whereas with say heart disease, that never makes the news when an individual dies of heart disease. They're also one-off events, even though they happen much more frequently than terrorist attacks. And to some extent, that's in our control. I could do some more exercise. I could eat better. I'm not, but I could. Um, I think we feel powerless with respect to terrorism and especially the way in which it gets sensationalized. And that's why the fear takes hold. But statistically, none of you in this room are going to die in a terrorist attack. So don't worry about it. The second question is, do young people need to study terrorism in a global and uh, in a global and uh, common sense, uh, and uh, is this should be a topic in the schools? So I don't think everyone needs to study it. No, because it's so, it's such an aberration from sort of our normal lives. Would you maybe want a, a week-long block on 9-11 in an American history course? Sure. But in terms of detailed study, I'm not sure this is something that needs to be universally applicable. That said, I do think it's important that sort of rigorous curricula exist for those students who are interested in working in this space and are specifically interested in the topic. So I think sort of a university curriculum uh, makes a lot of sense. And I teach a course every spring, I'm doing it this spring too, called Understanding and Responding to Terrorism. It's an upper level undergraduate course. And um, I think it's, it's a lot of fun to teach. I hope my students get a fair bit out of it. And I think it's really useful for the students who opt into taking this elective course, who tend to be folks who are studying international security, 
um, and looking to go into sort of the government policy space in this field. So I think we do have an obligation to sort of make rigorous academic curriculum available, but I don't think this should be something that's required for every student because it is such a rare event. Another question, will we ever defeat terrorism or it will grow into something else? No, we never will. Um, we're approaching this fundamentally the wrong way, right? We're attacking the capabilities, but not the sort of underlying motivations that cause people to join terrorist organizations. And so let me give you an example. There was a really great study done by the RAND Corporation in the Pakistani tribals, and they were looking at the use of UAS, unmanned aerial systems, so drones colloquially, um, to target sort of pa TTP members, Pakistani Taliban members. Um, and they did an interview with a guy whose uncle was killed in a drone strike. And the guy basically admitted that his uncle was a member of the Pakistani Taliban and his uncle was a bad guy and his uncle probably deserved to die. But he was angry at the United States because of the, in his words, cowardly way in which his uncle was killed, right? For a guy living in the um, tribal areas of Pakistan with no access to technology, it was cowardly to die at the hands of some aerial platform with no pilot, at least no pilot up above, uh, that they couldn't see or defend themselves against, right? And that local perception matters a lot because this guy now had this deep-seated grievance against the United States, and that may have made him and his community members much more likely to then go join the TTP, whereas they may not have otherwise. So I think the we need to be really cognizant of how sort of counterterrorism activities are perceived in the environments where they're used, and I don't think we are. And I think we also need to look at sort of the grievances that join that lead people to be susceptible to join these organizations. It's a lack of sort of political openness and opportunity, a lack of economic opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. And unless you start targeting those root causes, you're never going to get a handle on the on terrorism. And I don't think there's much incentive to do so because it's far more difficult to say alleviate economic inequality in rural Pakistan than it is to go out and kill or capture a few people. And if I'm an elected leader in the United States, I'm thinking with two year time horizons, right? Because that's when the next Congress gets voted in. And even if I'm not a congressperson, I care that my party maintains control or not. As such, I need to be able to show results to my constituents quickly. I can get on CNN tomorrow and tell you I killed or captured some important terrorist leader. I can start a development aid program tomorrow. I will not have results to show you that are meaningful, and that it meaningfully affects sort of terrorism inside of that two-year time horizon where I need to be campaigning. And so until we get over those barriers, we're never gonna have a, so, a true solution to this problem. My guess is we're gonna continue to sort of ignore this reality and keep doing what we're doing, unfortunately. And that's my personal opinion. It's not reflective of the University of Maryland or anyone else. <laughs> Thank you. Here's another question, Burnett. What are the latest trends in global terrorist threat? And what are the priorities and interventions in addressing, addressing them? Absolutely. So the global terrorism data gives us really good um, vision as to what the trends are, because you can plot data globally, by region, by country, etc. And so there's some good news in that terrorist attacks have been trending down for the last, globally, for the last three or four years. Um, they're still a bit, the rates are still abysmally high. There's still about 10,000 attacks, successful attacks a year. Um, so down is good, but it's not where it needs to be. Um, a lot of this, though, what you'll see if you look at the data is it's clustered very tightly geographically. Um, the best predictor of terrorism tomorrow is terrorism today. So you have a handful of countries that are experiencing the overwhelming majority of attacks. Not surprisingly, these are countries that are already very violent. So think Iraq, um, Syria, Pakistan, um, and elsewhere. The, downward trend is largely due to sort of the demise, demise is the wrong word, but sort of the loss of influence of the Islamic State, right? They held physical territory in Iraq and Syria for a few years. And during those few years, terrorism hit its zenith in terms of number of attacks. 
They no longer hold that territory and thus attacks are down. It doesn't mean that groups like the Islamic State though are no, more, no longer important. They've branched out and are active in 30 something countries today. And that makes it a really, really hard problem to defeat because you can't simply cut up the head off the snake in Syria and be done with it. It'll regenerate from its base in the Philippines or its base in Mali or so on and so forth um, 30 something times over. If you drill down, though, to a specific country, you can see really interesting subnational trends. And I can't go through all 190-something countries in the course of this discussion, but maybe I'll just give you the US example to highlight this. For the last four, year, four or five years or so, the US has trended about 60 to 65 terrorist attacks a year. I think the height was 67 uh, in the last couple of years. This is the highest it's ever been, higher than 2001. Um, and importantly, in the last four years or so, we've moved away from international groups like the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, where in the most violent active groups today are domestic terrorist organizations in the US, um, and almost exclusively with violent far-right ideologies. Um, so sort of the threat picture in the US has changed massively in the last sort of half decade as well. The, thank you, Barnett. Here is another question. Uh, what about the spread of terrorism on social media and social networks and inter internet? Is there any possibility of network assistance in one way or the other in order to prevent uh, the terrorism to use uh, the internet for their dominance? Yeah, so this is a great question. And before I answer the question in terms of how to get a handle of this, let me just summarize a couple of key facts about terrorist use of social media and the internet. Right, I think Al Qaeda revolutionized the use of media um, to really get their message out there. Now, they did this through traditional media, so television broadcasts and things of that sort. But they figured it out and their approach worked. And because it worked, it got adopted by other organizations. Um, the Islamic State, I think, did a lot of the work of bringing Al Qaeda strategy into the 21st century and figuring out how to use the internet and social media. And so back when the Islamic State had a physical caliphate in Iraq and Syria, if you went to join, you'd cross the border, say, from Gaziantep, Turkey, into Syria. And as you crossed, they'd immediately take away your smartphone, um, but they'd give it back. They were looking at it. They wanted to see if there was anything suspicious or maybe you were spying on them or things of that sort. But they made a point to give them back because they realized for their fighters, having one of these was just as important as having a rifle or a bomb, right? Their fighters could produce propaganda from the battlefield in their own native language in, in a manner that would resonate with the culture of their local communities from back wherever they came from, whether it was the United States, the Philippines, um, Chechnya, doesn't matter and get more people into the fight in doing so. Social media massively facilitated um, sort of radicalization and mobilization to violence. And so the University of Maryland has another data set called Profiles of Individual Radicalization in the US. And this is detailed life course analysis on over 2,000 um, individuals who have committed uh, criminal violent extremist behavior of one flavor or another. And what we saw in the last sort of, it's sort of in the 2010s. So in the 2000s, let me start there, maybe 25% of all individuals engaging in terrorism or violent extremism had any connectivity on social media with sort of violent extremist narratives. In the 2010s, that had flipped to where it was about 75% of individuals. But more importantly, the timeline from radicalization to, mobiliz to mobilization went from about three years on average to a low of just about three months um, as a result of how quickly someone could get absorbed and connected into this milieu through the internet and social media. Um, so it's a powerful tool for sure. It's a double-edged tool as well because it is monitorable by state security agencies, law enforcement, intelligence communities, et cetera. Um, so attacks that got planned on social media were actually far more likely to get interdicted and disrupted because of that sort of operational security vulnerability. But even still, it's a powerful tool. Government is aware of this. There's a need to do more. Social media companies are motivated by a profit-driven motivation. This is not their core business dealing with sort of terrorist use. They'll deal with it 
when it becomes economically advantageous for them to do so. And so the British Parliament in particular, but other legislatures have put a lot of pressure and imposed financial penalties on the larger social media outlets like, like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. And that's forced them to start building their own counterterrorism teams and start to take this seriously. But they're incentivized by a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to do the minimum possible here um, to keep regulators off of their back. Um, so this is not going to be a solution that comes purely organically from social media companies. That said, they have created tools like the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism, or GIFCT, where different social media platforms can exchange information and know-how over these types of issues. But you've also got a bigger problem. Facebook's a multi-billion dollar company, but there's a new social media app emerging every month, it seems like. And most of these are start, started by two college dropouts in their garage. And I'm being a little bit facetious for effect. But those sort of startup companies with two employees working out of a garage don't have the budget nor the expertise in-house to do anything about this, even if they did have the social conscience. So more needs to come from outside of the social media companies. We can't just rely on them to take care of this for us. There are academic researchers um, in particular at Carnegie Mellon University, there's a number of sort of computer scientists who do really interesting sort of network um, or social network analysis to sort of identify um, what's trending and who's propagating this information on the internet. And so those types of initiatives are great, um, but clearly a lot more needs to be done. I hate sort of social media, I don't use any of it, so I'm not the right person to be talking to about exactly what should be done here. I'm definitely not the expert, but Others are. And this probably will be our last question. And this is how do you fight terrorism if the most popular films and series among young people are Paper House, where the main theme is terrorism, violence, and brutality? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think we do sensationalize this and make this threat out to be much bigger than it really is through sort of these popular depictions of terrorism. And so I may be dating myself a little bit here, but I remember when the TV show 24 came out um, and right, that was sort of one of the first sort of post 9-11 takes on this. And it was totally fictional and totally sensationalized and not at all useful in terms of shaping public understanding. So that's not helpful. Um, and I don't know how you get at that. Um, ideally, you'd have Hollywood, I mean, Hollywood and whoever's producing these sort of try and provide some education as to what maybe second and third order effects these are having and how to be more realistic about the portrayal. There's a really interesting series on Netflix called Fauda though. Um, and the Fauda has gotten a lot of critical acclaim. And so it looks at sort of an Israeli um, Defense Forces counterterrorism unit and some of their work in the, um, uh, in Palestine in sort of the occupied territories in the Gaza Strip. Um, and I think the reason Fauda has gotten a lot of critical acclaim claim is because it takes a really balanced under, uh, approach to looking at this. It doesn't, it doesn't sort of put the Israeli defense forces up on a pedestal. It shows them as human. And it also shows the um, terrorist groups as human as well. And gives you some sense of what grievance that they have that motivate their engagement. And so if you want to make a film or a TV show about terrorism, perhaps the Fauda model is better informed than the 24 model. Um, and I think more Faudas and less 24s would be really helpful in terms of changing sort of popular perceptions. That's a wonderful thought because actually I do work with somebody who does do write and create movies. I'll definitely have them listen to your presentation. But yeah. Burnett, it has been just wonderful uh, having you and hearing you and listening to your discussion. And uh, I do hope that we'll be able to invite you again when you, especially after your book comes out, maybe it will be like an educational series, which is exactly what we're doing. We've been doing this since last May, so that because we had to stop our UN internship program. So this is a substitute. So then I'll be able to invite you as a lecturer as soon as your um, book comes out. Do you have any other thoughts um, before we close the session? <laughs> 
Nothing substantive, but I did want to say thank you to you, Dr. Derbeck, for organizing this. And also thank you for everyone who took the time to dial in today. And to your point, Dr. Derbeck, I'm happy to engage anytime I can be helpful. Just let me know. And if anyone else has any follow-up that comes later, so if there's questions a week from now that people think of, feel free to put them in touch with me, Dr. Derbeck. I'm happy to continue the conversation offline with anyone if it would be useful. Again, thank you very, very much. Have a very good week. Take good care of yourself. The best of luck in your near future, because in the far future, I'll be in touch with you again. And I just wanted to mention the next week, we we're going to have Katerina Pavlova, who is the former head of the Chernobyl Restricted Zone. And she's going to be talking about the modern modular nuclear reactors, which take very, very little space, produce very, very little nuclear waste, and should be something that should be considered by every country that is capable of it because of what's going on with the climate change, as we're evidence, not only in the world, but by Texas. So bye-bye, and have a very good book. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.